Hello, and today we are answering all of your top PCOS questions. So PCOS Q&A. Hello friends, I am Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and fertility doctor. And today we're talking all about PCOS and answering your PCOS questions. Now I know PCOS can be so confusing. It stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome, but really that name leaves a lot to be desired. So I'm gonna break down very quickly what PCOS is if you have not been around or watched previous videos, I do have some videos breaking that down for you. And just overall, if you're new to the channel, welcome. I am here to help empower you with knowledge about your body. So if you know more, you can make better decisions. So I'd love it if you would subscribe and stick around. I will be doing these Q and A's on different topics. So you can follow along in the stories or the community tab or ask questions on these videos and we'll be answering them as we go. So PCOS is a disease in which the ovary is not responding appropriately. Overall, it's an ovary issue. In reality, it's really the ovary and the brain communicate. So the pituitary gland in the brain sends out signals that cause the ovary to respond. The way that I always use this analogy is if you imagine inside the ovary is a vault where all your eggs are kept. Each month, a group of eggs comes out of the vault. Each egg grows in a follicle. The brain sends out follicle stimulating hormone or FSH, which stimulates a follicle to grow. As that follicle grows, the egg matures and makes estrogen. And then afterward, you ovulate once you have a mature egg. That follicle then turns into the corpus luteum and makes progesterone. And when you're not pregnant, progesterone drops, corpus luteum dies, and you get a period. And this process happens over and over again. Now, what happens in PCOS is really there is a miscommunication between the brain and the ovary. So I like to think about the true etiology is often having a lot of eggs inside the ovary. And what happens is all of those eggs get released. So an interesting fact is that when you have more eggs in the vault, more come out every month. So you have a lot of eggs coming out of the vault and every egg, when it doesn't grow, makes a teeny bit of estrogen. Enough though in PCOS to tell the brain that it doesn't need to send out as much FSH. So you have a little bit lower FSH signal from the brain because you have so many follicles making a little bit of estrogen and the ovaries often get stuck in this non-ovulatory pattern. Now it progresses to have other issues. The ovaries love to make hormones. They're a hormone making factory. Estrogen is their hormone du jour. However, they can't make estrogen if you're not ovulating. So what that means is they get bored and they start making more testosterone. And that can cause some of the symptoms we see with PCOS like acne, extra hair growth, central weight gain like abdominal weight gain, and also insulin resistance. So there's a whole metabolic component that happens as well. Now, one thing to note is that being overweight can make PCOS worse, but that doesn't mean you are overweight or everybody with PCOS is overweight. You may not know that your fat cells actually make some estrogen. And so when you have more fat cells, the brain senses that there's more estrogen and sends out even a lower signal of FSH. And that's why losing a little bit of weight can cause some people to start ovulating better because now that suppression on the brain is released. But certainly very thin people can have PCOS as well. So the internet sometimes tells you things that are not right, like only people overweight get PCOS. The other thing is PCOS is diagnosed by the Rotterdam criteria, which are two out of three, irregular periods, any signs of having high androgens, blood work or clinical symptoms, and a certain ultrasound appearance of your ovaries, which looks like ring of pearls, meaning like a pearl necklace on the outside of the ovary. I'm gonna dive into your questions. Thank you for answering these. We're gonna keep doing these Q&A videos. I would love to hear options about trying to get pregnant with PCOS at 24. I've done two cycles of letrozole without much luck and I'm looking into doing IUI. I would love to hear your perspective if I will have an easier time getting pregnant now when I'm in my twenties versus later on. So absolutely, no matter PCOS or not, getting pregnant in your twenties is always going to be easier than getting pregnant later. That is because our eggs degrade with time and you have an increase in genetic abnormalities, which makes your egg quality worse, means you have a lower chance of getting pregnant per month as you get older and you have a higher chance of miscarrying. So one, you have to ovulate with PCOS, that's usually the rate limiting step, but two, you can have a harder time when you're older just because of egg quality, even if you ovulate. So absolutely getting pregnant sooner if you're ready to be a parent is a wonderful idea. It sounds like with PCOS, you're doing the right treatment. Letrozole is a medication that can help you ovulate. Letrozole 
eats up estrogen in the periphery. It's what we call an aromatase inhibitor. And what that means is if you have less estrogen, the brain will send out a stronger signal of FSH. Does not work for everybody. So if you do not get your period or you do not ovulate, you might need to go up in dose. But once you've achieved an ovulatory dose at age 24, you should have approximately a 25% chance of getting pregnant per month that you're using it. That's excellent. It is okay if you haven't been pregnant after two cycles. I would say I'd wanna make sure the semen analysis is normal and your fallopian tubes are open because you can have two problems at one time. I would recommend an IUI if there's any sperm abnormalities, but if the sperm is fine and you are ovulating, keep going. This is a good treatment strategy. I usually have people who I let them try to ovulate for four to six months. And then if you're not pregnant after that time, depending on your age, we'll talk about advancing care. Some people can't ovulate with oral medications and they need injectable hormones or IVF. And that's a totally different ball game. All right. So another question says, should I start with Clomid or Metformin before moving to gonadotropins? Gonadotropins are injectable shots of FSH or LH. Now Clomid is another medication that can be used to induce ovulation. It is what we call a selective estrogen receptor modulator or CIRM. It actually binds estrogen receptors. And one of the places it binds them is in the brain. So the brain says, oh my gosh, there's no estrogen, and it sends out a really strong signal of FSH, that then can help you ovulate. Now, Clomid can have more side effects, so there's more mood changes, you can have worse headaches, and there's actually some negative side effects that can happen at the uterus because there's estrogen receptors in the lining, so having a thin endometrial lining is one side effect. A huge study was done comparing Clomid versus Letrozole and actually showed that Letrozole had a higher live birth rate than Clomid. So Letrozole is first line for ovulation induction with PCOS. Prior to using Letrozole, there was a study looking at Clomid or Metformin or the combination of them. And Clomid or Clomid and Metformin outperform Metformin alone significantly. Metformin is a medication that can be used for insulin resistance and it can, in a small subset of people, help you start to ovulate. I usually do both at the same time. So if you have PCOS, especially if you have insulin resistance documented on blood work, I'm gonna start to on metformin. Then we're also gonna induce ovulation, typically with letrozole. Clomid's not a wrong choice, just letrozole's more preferred. Absolutely before gonadotropins. Gonadotropins are injectable FSH and LH. I use these rarely in people with PCOS because typically what will happen is you get so many eggs developing that you often have to cancel cycles. They require much more monitoring, they're much more expensive, and they have a high cycle cancellation rate and also a high risk of high order multiples. So even though you may be okay with twins, we don't really need John and Kate plus eight, four babies, five babies, whatever that may be. So you have to be monitored very closely. Gonadotropins are also the medications you use for IVF. So for me, if a patient needs gonadotropins, very often we're moving on to IVF. But the answer to this question is starting with oral medication options, usually metformin plus clomid or letrozole is a really great place to start. Has PCOS always been around? Is it a new thing? I feel like every woman I talk to has it now. Are there environmental factors? I feel like there's an abundance of cases now when previously was considered rare. PCOS has never been rare. I do think we are more comfortable talking about our menstrual cycles and fertility issues, so we are hearing more about it. I also think that there's a lot of people who aren't getting what they need from their mainstream doctor, and so they are looking to social sites and other people to help educate them. But also, to the root of this question, we do think there are some environmental triggers. One is there's something called epigenetics. So we know that if your mom does certain things when she's pregnant, you have a higher risk of developing PCOS. And so there's definitely triggers when the ovaries are being programmed. We do think there's environmental influences, just like we're seeing an increase in autoimmune disease and other inflammatory diseases. Some of this is easier access. Some of this is increased knowledge, more people seeking care because you know having irregular periods is not normal, but some of this is largely probably environmentally influenced. We think that environmental toxins and hormone disruptors and endocrine disrupting chemicals do leave long lasting impacts on your fertility and how your brain and your ovaries communicate. Hi, Natalie, thank you for this video. You mentioned hormonal treatment. Is the combined pill with both estrogen and progestin recommended or progestin only? Thank you. I think it really depends here on what we're looking for. So if you are trying to get pregnant, then a combined pill with estrogen and progesterone is not gonna be useful, it's preventing pregnancy. 
If you would like to get pregnant and maybe you have irregular periods but ovulate sometimes, we will use a pill with progesterone only intermittently. Like after three months, if you haven't had a period, take a pregnancy test and then use a progesterone. The reason why this is important is that one of the bad outcomes that can come from PCOS is actually an increased risk of endometrial cancer. And this is why your OBGYNs are so obsessed with you having a period because those small follicles or eggs are all making a little bit of estrogen and that is growing the lining of the uterus constantly. The uterus doesn't get a signal to have a period or to bleed until you have progesterone and then it's gone. So this is called progesterone withdrawal. The only way in nature you get progesterone is from ovulating. So if you are not ovulating, you're not going to get a true period. You might get some overflow spotting, and I use an analogy like a cup all the time. So if we imagine that the cup is your uterus and I have the faucet on drip, it's constantly filling up a little bit. Now, having progesterone or ovulating it shuts the faucet off, and then when you're not pregnant, it's dumping out the cup and getting a full period. But if you don't ovulate, you're constantly making estrogen and the faucet's always on drip, you might get to a place where you have overflow bleeding. It's not a real period, like dark, spotty, constant, irregular blood, and I'm not getting rid of these cells down here at the bottom, which are the highest risk for actually contributing to uterine or endometrial cancer. So having periods is an important thing, unless you're on hormonal contraception that prevents the lining from growing. So the combined birth control pill with estrogen and progesterone, a daily pill of progesterone if you're not trying to get pregnant or progesterone-based IUD, those circumstances you don't have to have a period because we're not worried, we don't have the lining growing. But if you are trying to get pregnant, we would be a progesterone only. And if you're not trying to get pregnant, the combined birth control pill with estrogen and progesterone has the added benefit of increasing the production of something called sex hormone binding globulin from the liver. Long word, but the take home is, sex hormone binding globulin gobbles up and binds to testosterone. So it lowers your testosterone levels, therefore can decrease some of the symptoms that people have like hair growth and acne. And this is why dermatologists also love the combined birth control pill. If you're dealing with severe acne, it is one of the things that they love to add in because it's very effective at lowering testosterone levels. But that is only from the combined pill with both estrogen and progesterone. You do not get that from a progesterone only contraceptive choice. Do you have any realistic weight loss advice for people with PCOS if we are extra curvy or need to get to a significantly lower BMI before we start treatment? Doctor had put me on an 800 calorie crash diet and somehow I'm gaining and feel like baby is even less of a realistic option. I'm in my mid thirties, I'm insulin resistant, and I'm still struggling to shed hundred pounds I gained during law school. Thanks PCOS. First of all, a 800 calorie diet is extremely ineffective and you're gonna gain that weight back extremely fast and you might even have rebound from the increased cortisol because your body is so stressed out. So I do not love this plan. Number one, there are weight loss doctors who really can help. We have seen a lot of success in PCOS patients with Ozempic, which is a diabetic medication. So the PCO insulin resistant patient, I have had people lose significant amount of weight and keep it off with success. So that could be something I don't prescribe, but there are weight loss doctors who do. So that could be something to talk about. As far as general for my PCOS patients, what I say is decreasing your stress and your cortisol is essential to losing your weight. Number one, you gotta sleep eight hours a day. You got to, consistent hours. Number two, you need to exercise. So exercise has been really debated in the PCOS world, but for people specifically looking to lose weight, even 15 minutes of a high intensity exercise can be helpful. I say whatever you're going to stick to is gonna be the best. So if you can do 15 minutes, great. If you can do 30 minutes of more moderate, walk outside, walk on the treadmill, do yoga whatever you can stick to. It does appear that doing your exercise first thing in the morning is going to be better for your insulin resistance and managing that is really key to losing the weight. Diets high in fiber, fruits, veggies, and whole grains. You do not need to be keto or gluten-free for most of the time. Very few people need to be gluten-free. Occasionally, if you notice feeling really bloated after eating gluten, you might wanna exclude it. But typically those whole grain carb sources are very good for most people. Also dairy, some PCOS patients are sensitive to dairy. I don't say everybody has to take it out. But what I usually recommend is 30 days of none. No dairy, no gluten, no sugar, 
no processed foods, lots of fruits, veggies. If you eat meat, then eat meat. We like fish and other sources of leaner meat, red meat one time per week at most. So typically I say 30 days, I want meatless Monday, no meat at all. I want no dairy, no gluten, no sugar, no processed foods. The other days of the week, I want you to have meat one time a day. We'll call it dinner for the sake of this. And I want you to only have red meat one time per week. That means you're going to be filling up those other aspects of the days with other veggies and nutritious foods. And eating like that, I've had patients lose a significant amount of weight. I hope this PCOS Q&A video has been helpful. We are going to do more Q&A videos. You can ask some questions in the comments as well, and we'll grab from those for the next PCOS video. Thank you guys so much. And as always, please subscribe to the channel and you can get more information on the As Woman podcast or follow along on Instagram at nataliecrawfordmd.com.